It's a great joy to be with you, my dear brothers and sisters, after a lapse of time. And it is the will of God that we should be together, worshipping him in truth and spirit. And I'm so sure that uh, you all would be willing to receive the glad tidings from around the world. And we are glad to share with you all from the different parts of the world. And I would also like to share some interesting experiences which I had in Africa. And whenever I visit the countries, the people always send their greetings to every brother and every sister, wherever they are. And I have brought their greetings to you, to be conveyed to you. And I hope you all would accept those greetings. Thank you, brethren. Today, let us open our Bible to Isaiah chapter 1, verse 6, which gives us a clear understanding of the condition of man. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 6. From the sole of the foot, even unto the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and purifying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Here we see the condition of man struck with sinfulness, struck with all, all malice and maladies, wounds and bruises, which needs attention, which needs healing, which need to be restored. Now, this is the condition of individual man. And if you turn to Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 22. <clears throat> Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 22. Even 21 and 22. For the heart of the daughter of my people are my heart. I am black. Astonishment, astonishment had taken hold on me. Is there no bomb in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered? Of course, there is a subject that we can deal with the bomb of Kilyat. And that is exclusively interesting subject to study. But here we see the people of God as a whole. They are not in good condition either. They are sick. They are stricken by diseases. Right? And these people also need to be restored. And I would like to read from Medical Ministry, page 187, corresponding to these two things. One, as individual, we are sick. Sin sick. And as a church, we are also sick and in a way needs to be restored. In the morning, Brother Nadrajan was asking eh, if we understand our condition in a true sense. If we say, no, we are already reached that perfection and we are not violating God's commandment or if we, are, if we say that we are not sinful, then we are liars. That the Bible is very clear on that. 
Now let me read from Medical Ministry 187, which speaks of the human family, means every individual is sick. The human family is suffering because of the transgression of the law of God. Satan is constantly urging, urging men to accept his holy principles. And thus, he is seeking to counterwork the work of God. He is constantly representing the chosen people, of chosen people of God as deluded people. He is an accuser of the brethren, and his accusing power he is constantly using against those who work righteousness. The Lord desires through his people to answer Satan's charges by showing the result of obedience to the right principles. And now, as a church, in Heavenly Places, page 90, we read, In the church militant, men will ever be in need of restoration. We have to make an emphasis over there. In the church mil militant, men will be ever in need of restoration. We should understand that. From the result of sin. The one who is in some respects is superior to another is in other respects inferior to him. Every human being is subject to temptation and in need of brother interest and sympathy. The exercise of mercy in our daily relations with one another is one of the most effective means of attaining perfection of character. For only those who walk with Christ can be truly merciful. The focal point here is we will ever be in need of restoration. So we understand that we need to be restored as individuals and as a church. Now, today my desire is to set forth the fundamental, fundamental or basic principles that are in relation to restoration, the underlying principles for restoration and reformation. When we hear the word restoration, it implies many things to us. Restoration implies, number one, that there is something corrupt. You all agree with me? That which is not corrupt at all doesn't need to be restored. Doesn't need restoration. So the first prin principle that all must understand when we speak of restoration is that there is something corrupt. There is, there is something that is not right. And the second principle is when you want to restore things to its original or to their landmarks, then you need that exact pattern. The pattern is needed. And number three, you understand that Something is corrupt, and you have the pattern. And we need to have the unity of purpose. And number four, having all these three is not enough. The work must be done. These are the four fundamental principles. Let us get into ourselves. So, our focus today is to learn these fundamental principles. And I will draw back your minds to the time of the old, the time of the King Josiah. How old was he when he ruled the kingdom? 
Josiah was eight years old. So small a boy. And he ruled the kingdom. And we understand if we study the genealogy, he was a descendant of David and Solomon and so forth and so forth. Eh? And we will not touch those things. And his father, what was his name? Ammon. Was not doing that which was right in the Lord. In other words, Ammon was a corrupt king. Ammon was an idolatrous king. He offered sacrifices to idols. But on the contrary, Josiah was a different man. And as soon as he began reigning the country, and he started destroying all those altars, temples, made by his father Ammon. Because he did not like what his father was doing. And he destroyed all the idolatrous places. And now, in the 18th year of his reign, I mean, the 18th year of Josiah's reign, a project of restoring the temple was undertaken. Because he destroyed and he wanted to rebuild. But now, here was a man, his name was Hil Hilkiah. And he was a high priest, and he went to find money or collect money to pay for the workers. And then when he went to the temple, and he fortunately found a book. And he found the book, and he did not keep silent. He acted upon, and he brought that book. And that was the book of Moses, or God's law. And he brought it before the king to be read. And he asked Saphnan, that is what we read from the scriptures, right? In Second Chronicles, chapter 34, verses 15 and 16. We read, and Hilkiah answered and said to Shaphman, the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah delivered the book to Shaphman. So, who is Shaphman now? A scribe. A scribe means who can understand, means he is educated. Shall we say that? who could explain the scriptures. So he was a scribe. And that is why he gave the book to Shaphman. And he opens the book. And Hilkiah delivered the book to Shaphan. And Shaphan carried the book to the king. And brought the king word back again, saying, all that was committed to thy servants, they do it. So Shaphan was reading the book to the king, and the king commands that whatever you read in that book, exactly do it. What's the command? Now, let us compare the time of Josiah and our time. In Josiah's time, the house of Israel was corrupt. <coughs> and their worship was corrupt. They had idolatrous practices. And the temple was in desperate condition. They were not reading the law or commandments of God. And they were ultimately, imperatively, they were not following the commandments. And the worship were also wrong. And they were not observing the Passover and so forth. But now, in our day, do we see such corruptions amidst us or around us? 
Do we have false religions around the world? Meaning, religions are corrupt today. The worship is corrupt today. Many temples are lying in desperate conditions. They lie in despair. Not only the cathedral or the building we speak of, but as a whole, the church of God is in a lamentable condition. Then it needs to be restored. That is why we are talking about those fundamental principles. We understand that something is corrupt, not only in the time of Josiah, but also today. Constantly, we will have, we read it, constantly there needs to be restoration. That is what we read. And today, in the world, we find so many kinds of doctrine, winds of doctrines, and false religion, false thoughts being conveyed to the people. And ultimately, they are misled. But now in order, when, when you have, say, for example, when you have your father's house, inherited house, but suppose it is being old and it needs to be renovated or repaired, you would try to understand the exact condition of the building. You will try to estimate how much it would cost and so forth. And not only that, you will also try to see what? The original blueprint. The original blueprint in, in the sense that the original pattern, the plan. Unless you get that one, you cannot restore it to the originality. That's it. So we need to understand that the original plan or the pattern is needed. The need of the pattern is a must when we want to restore something to its original condition. Right? In Josiah's case, when did he start that restoration? Restoration of the temple. When Hilkiah found the book. When, he, when Hilkiah found the book of the law, then he started restoring the temple. And so also, today, when you want to, or when we want to, let us put together, uh, when we want to restore the church to its original condition, what do we need? The original pattern. And what is the original pattern? The word of God. The word of God. Let us stand to our Bible. Luke chapter 8. Verse 11. And here we see that the seed is the word of God. A seed is the pattern to produce the original. From seed, what do you get? Do you get two things from one seed or only one thing out of one seed? Suppose you plant an apple tree, and what do you get? Apple tree. You don't get peach. Peaches out of an apple tree. Right? It is a simple thing. Whatever you plant, you will get the very plant and very fruit out of it. So the seed is the word of God, and the seed is the pattern. And in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, we read, he speaks of the incorruptible seed and the corruptible seed. Meaning, we have corrupted seeds and also we have incorruptible seeds. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God. So what is the incorruptible seed? Or the seed that can germinate sprout and ultimately be grown into a tree 
And ultimately what will happen? Produce fruits. What is that tree? Or what is that seed? The word of God. And Jesus exactly portrays this one. He shall know them by their fruits. And if you are not planted off that uncorruptible seed, you are not going to bear any fruit. Fruit which will receive God's approval. Right. So we understand that the seed is the word of God. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 13 we read, Hold the pattern of sound words or sound doctrines which thou hast heard from me in faith and love which is in Christ. Here what we read. The pattern of sound words. Sound doctrine is the pattern. What we call it old landmark. We must ask for it. We must study about them. They will guide us into the truth. And the truth will make us free. Right? In Romans chapter 6 verse 17. We read. But God be thanked. That ye were the servants of sin. But ye have obeyed. You have obeyed from the heart. That form of doctrine which was delivered to you. So the word of God. From cover to cover, many read today. Right? And yet, it doesn't influence them, many of them, in, in any way. It doesn't make any effect. Why? Because they don't study the word of God, precepts upon precepts, lines upon Line here a little and there a little. What do they do? I'm not pointing finger at them. It could be you and me. Amen. Right? <laughs> Studying only here and there. Not placing precepts upon precepts and precepts upon precepts, lines upon lines. Then we have a danger there. So when we study the word of God, we should do that. Then we establish the doctrine. And the doctrines are what? Call the right pattern which will lead us to Christ. We should follow that. So you have, you understand something that was corrupt. And you understand what is the pattern for us to follow. So that the restoration can be complete. You allow me up to 12. Okay. Then... The third principle, underlying principle, fundamental principle, principle, principle for restoration was there must be unity of purpose. In today's lesson, we have a connection with today's lesson. The SAS was pointing out in the opening remarks by the Spirit of Prophecy, the set of ages, page 208. My authority, he said, for doing the work of which you accuse me is that I am the Son of God, one with him in nature, in will, and in purpose. So here we see the perfect union of the Father and the Son. And Christ's prayer is that as my Father and myself are one, so also the disciples or my followers, you will be so. That was his desire. That was his prayer. Am I right? In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 6, 1 to 6 or 7, we read the unity of the body of Christ. We must be united. United we stand, divided we fall. Paul writes about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. A complete system that should work together. The body of Christ, right? The 
hand cannot do apart from the body, apart from the mind. So you don't have individual parts to work. They all work in conjunction with one will, one purpose, one motive, that is the body. And the body of Christ should function in such a way. Now, similarly, we have the unity of purpose. And what is that unity of purpose? Let me put it in the way that we have been contemplating. You know, we have understood that there was something corrupt. And we have the pattern. Now imagine, your father has given you the house and he has given you the blueprint. But you are not an architect. And you don't read the plan. Right? Where there is a door, you may misunderstand that there is a window. Where there is a window that you may think that it is a polygony. And so forth. So then, what do you need? You need, tell me, a Philip to explain. A Philip to the Ethiopian eunuch. He explained the scriptures from Isaiah, right? Yeah. So also, we need the chief architect to explain us. The one who huh, drafted it or drafted it, we need. And who is the chief architect? We read Christ himself. And whatever you want to make, whatever you want to undo, the final decision should be from where? The chief architect. So you may be willing to do something. There is a saying, man proposes God, disposes. Paul exactly says the same thing. Huh? The flesh is willing and the spirit is willing, flesh is weak. You may be willing to do everything in accordance with the blueprint. But unless God helps you, unless Jesus directs you to do, except the Lord builds the building or building the house, everything is in way. You understand? So, when Josiah undertook that work of restoration, God was with him. He had the pattern, and he would build it, and he called the people, and they were all united with the purpose, and they were going to do the work. And he called all the priests and scribes to work. And so also, we need to have that kind of spirit. Jesus prayed for unity. That we should be working together. Let us read John chapter 17 verses 20 and 21. John chapter, Gospel of John chapter 17 verses 20 and 21. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou Father art in me, and I in thee. That they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Unless we are a united force, a united people, we would not testify that Jesus, or we, uh, we will not testify that we are followers of him. So in order to prove ourselves that we are obedient disciples or followers of Christ, we must be one. That is the requisite. And Paul commanded unity. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 10, he says, Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 10, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye shall speak the same thing, and there be no division among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. So, when you build, or when you rebuild, when you restore, when you renovate, everything should be placed in order. Right? Not in a haphazard manner. Everything should be 
perfectly joined together. Then that is called the building. When you restore the church of God, it ought to be so. You see, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3 to 6, endeavoring, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your high calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. Very clear that we should be one. Then the work can be done. Now, you have understood something is corrupt. You have the pattern and you have the architect we explain and you have the unity of purpose and so forth. Now everything is in place. You want to restore. Can you do it without involving yourself? You know, everything is there. Then, okay, everything is there. I tie my hand and sit back and relax. Can I do that? No. The point is, the work must be done. The work must be done. We need to focus on that working part. Josiah, when he read, or when he was hearing from Shaphan, the reading from the word of God, what he commanded, I want to get your mind, what he commanded, as you read from the book, do it. That was the command. And even if you read further, he sends to your prophetess to explain the whole thing. Right? Then he starts doing it. Rebuilding was done. So everybody goes forth to work. And this was the need, brethren. Josiah recognized there was a need for restoration. And so he went to work. So it becomes our duty, each one of's duty, to go forth and work. And our efforts in rebuilding and our efforts in restoration is a must. What are we called in Isaiah 58 verse 12? We are called repairs of the bridge and restorers of the path. So we are called to be repairers. We are called to be restorers. Then we need to put forth that effort that is required of us. In Matthew chapter 9 verse 37 and 38 Jesus says Then he said unto his disciples the harvest is truly plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into the harvest. So what is plenty? The harvest is plenty. The laborers are few. Why the laborers are few? We have over 6 million people, or 6 million people, on the earth today, or maybe touching 7 billion, right? Every second, you know, the population of the world is growing faster and faster. Then why he has few? Many are unwilling to go and work. That is the reason. Many are unwilling to go and work. But the Lord says he will send forth laborers into if we don't speak, if we are ashamed of the gospel, then the Lord will raise up the stones to speak. Right? We should not be ashamed of the gospel. We should go forth and work. And how often we are using every opportunity that is available to us to present the gospel, to present the present truth to everybody. Sometimes we keep aloof. You know, there may be passers by There may be who would be sitting by our side, but we are not opening our 
mouth to say the gospel, to preach the gospel. In Galatians chapter 6 verse 9, it calls us not to be wary. Dear brethren and sisters, we should not be wary. Here it says, and let us not be wary in well-doing. That includes preaching of the gospel and also that which was done by Jesus. Jesus, what he was doing here? His mission was to come and seek and save that which was lost. Was he doing that alone? Much more. He was going about doing good. He was healing the sick, eh? resurrecting the dead, and so forth. So we also should be doing the same. If you read Mark chapter 16, we read, you know, if we have that faith, amount of faith, we can do the same thing that Jesus did. Right? The work will follow. The miracles will follow. Wonders will follow. We have to do. But that would be wrought by prayers. Huh? The prayer of the righteous availeth much. In James we read. Okay, now, in First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9, for we are laborers together with God. God is not asking you to work alone. He will send the laborers. That could be you and me. And when we are sent, we should be work in conjunction with the will of God. Jesus was sent. Did he work anything of, his, uh, of himself? No. Today we read that everything that he did, he was doing the will of the Father. So also we should be doing the will of God. That is what is needed. Laborers together with God. And ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. And in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, we read. There we read, we should allow the will of God to work for us. The power of God should be working for us. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all what we ask or think. Even think according to the power that worketh in us. And to him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. It's a wonderful statement. He is able to do great things, exceedingly great, exceedingly abundant. In abundance, he can do things. But we should trust in him. We should have faith in him. Then he will be able to do wonderful things. So the plea for the restoration in Josiah's time is applicable to us today. Things should be restored. We understand that there is a corruption. We, under, we should understand that there is a pattern that is the word of God. And we should always work in conjunction with the chief architect. And we all should be united. United people. Unity of purpose should be there. Then, in, in the morning we read that there was a, the will and the purpose of the Father. You know, they were one. So we should also be one. Then more so, the willingness to work. So we must go forth and work. This is the point. I mean, these are the four principles, underlying principles that we should understand when we try to restore the things to the original condition. And now, we, the reformers, we want to do the same thing. Restore the things. Regaining to the original state in everything. Right? But now, what I was uh, saying, you know, restoration and reformation, once you restore the building, and you leave it unattending to the needs that may arise from time to time, what would be the condition? Tell me, brethren. Again, it will go to the same condition or maybe worse than that. So to upkeep that building, you will be 
doing the constant work. In, in a Christian life, that is called the work of sanctification. Huh? In the church of God, that is called the reformatory action that should be perpetual and unending until the end. Who will be saved? Tell me, brethren. The Bible says, he who endures until the end, he will be saved. So in order to be saved, we need to do that reformatory work constantly, perpetually, ongoing. Then we will be saved. Dear brethren, the invitation is given to each one of us. Understanding these principles, we should go forth and work. The Bible says there is a time when we cannot work. The night is approaching and we cannot do. While it is day, let us all go forth and do the work. And the Lord will multiply our hands. In conclusion, I just want to relate to you an illustration. There was a missionary. He was a wonderful missionary. He was doing wonderful work. But none appreciated him. Rather, always he was receiving stones and fault finding and so forth. So he was so much disheartened and discouraged and he decided to uh, take a stroll instead of going about doing the missionary work. And as he was taking a stroll in the woods, it was late, he walked and walked and he reached the woods, the jungles. And he was going through, he found a dim light flickering far away. So he moved forward, heading forward to the light. And ultimately what happened? He went there and there was a small house and he peeped in through the window and there was a lady who was a seamstress and she was working and he was watching and she was working then she was overtaken by tiredness and slowly she was dozing and dozing and she collapsed on the sewing machine now he was looking at her constantly watching then after a few seconds she shook her head oh it's time that I should finish the work you know she was so so, so tired you know she could not but because of the work because of the need for the work she started again pedaling machine and now that was a lesson for the missionary no matter what happens to you no matter how disappointed you are no matter how much stones you receive you should keep on working so immediately he returned to his place and he took the bag and the bible and he went forth to work brethren we need a great, we need to do a great work. And that is a work of restoration and reformation. And in conclusion, I will also read one statement. The statement from 2MR, page 34. Man cannot possibly work out his own salvation without the ordained divine power and God will not do for man that which he requires man shall do for himself through his own interest uh, own earnest willing cooperation man in the work of the saving of the soul is wholly dependent upon God he cannot of himself move one step toward Christ without the spirit of God draws him and this drawing is ever and will continue until man grieves the Holy Ghost by his persistent refusal. And continuing, the Spirit of God does not propose to do our part either in the willing or the doing. This is the work of the human agent in cooperating with the divine agencies. So we should be working together with God. 
then the work will be complete. Are we willing to cooperate with him? Are we willing to work for him? Is the question. God has given us a great invitation that we should go for, uh, go forth and work for him. It is all depending upon how we accept or reciprocate to that invitation. May God bless us that we will understand all these underlying principles in relation to restoration and reformation. And ultimately, we will follow each step in accordance with God's will. And so, the restoration will be complete and reformation will be ongoing so that all may be saved. And I pray that all would enter into the kingdom of God, having been restored to our original condition, original state. That is the perfect condition that Jesus prayed for. Huh? Be perfect, for my Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. My God. Father, we are so thankful unto thee, for thou hast gathered thy people to be assembled in thy holy name, on thy holy Sabbath, to be worshipping thee in truth and spirit. We are also thankful unto thee, for thou hast gathered thy people from around the world to meet together, to plan, to strategize for the work that is ahead of us, that we ought to do. We thank thee for all thy blessings upon each one of us, that we could do some work with the will of thine. And we would bring souls to Christ. At this hour, we pray that thou would continue to bless each one of us, that we may carry forward the work of thine. As much as we have learned today, that we should be in the spirit of Christ, seeking that which was lost and guiding them to the fold of our Savior. And as much as we learn the principles of restoration, help us, Lord, that we may understand these principles to the core and may fulfill our li in our lives following every principle. Help us to rebuild our own selves by the grace of thine. Help us also to redress and rebuild the church as a whole. Thou hast appointed apostles, teachers, and pastors. May we all be there in our respective places and do the work that is assigned to us so that thy building will be complete. Help us to grow day by day that we may imitate our Christ, our Savior in our lives. We may follow his footprints and we may also walk after his path of righteousness. Wash us and cleanse us for we understand that we are so weak and poor and sinless, Amen. wretched. And if we examine ourselves, we would come to the conclusion that we are chief of sinners. Amen. Together with Paul, our apostle. Then we need cleansing, Lord. Wash us. Cleanse us from all our iniquities and trespasses that we may be made whole and be acceptable unto thee. And we also pray that thou would examine us and we are ready and be willing to lay our souls open before thee that thou may examine us if we belong to thee. Indeed, enhance our faith, enhance ourselves in every way possible that we may fulfill thy requirements by obeying thy laws and thy commandments. Help every one of us. Grant us wisdom from above. 
that we may seek and do thy will. And we are praying for all the brethren and those who are shouldering greater responsibilities in thine vineyard. Use each one of them and each one of us as my, thy mighty instruments in thine own hand. And thou would send as thou hast promised. Thou would send us as laborers. And we will bring a great harvest unto thy fold. In the rest of the hour we pray that thou would be with us, that we may learn and share more of thy things and thy word. Enrich us in every way possible that we will fulfill the joy of heaven by learning and sharing and doing. Once again we pray thee that thou would be with us and continually guide us unto thy truth and the truth will make us free. All these blessings we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.